This week on The Anxious Truth, we're revisiting an old topic, emetophobia. That's the fear of vomiting or being sick to your stomach. I know this is really important to a lot of you. I know that even hearing the word could be triggering, but hang in there. We're going to do the best we can to be gentle with you. Let's get going. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 211, recorded on May 31st, 2022. And I think you're going to hear this in the first week of June. So if you are new to the podcast, I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that focuses on all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and recovery. So if you're dealing with problems like panic disorder, panic attacks, agoraphobia, health anxiety, in the case of today's episode, emetophobia, this is the place for you. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. Of course, if you are a returning listener or viewer, Welcome back. Always happy to see you here. So today we're going to cover the topic of emetophobia. Emetophobia is a specific phobia that focuses on the fear of vomiting, being sick to your stomach, being nauseous. That might be you or seeing somebody else being around other people that are having that problem. It is a big problem for a, a fairly large portion of our community. And in my opinion, in many cases, it is the underlying driver behind panic disorder and agoraphobia for some of you. Now, I know before we get started on the discussion that even the thought that you might we might talk about this, you might be afraid to listen to the rest of this podcast episode because you're afraid of being triggered. But I promise it's not super graphic. We try to be really careful with that. Uh, and it's a feel good story. It, it's a recovery story. And I think if you're looking for some hope and the fact that you can get better, even though you're convinced that emetophobia is the worst thing in the world, this episode can help you. So try to hang in there if possible. Before we get on, because I was joined by Holly in this one, Holly came back on the podcast. She's been on the podcast many times. She's uh, Holly and I did the Claire Week series together a couple of years ago. She's one of the admins in my Facebook group. She was gracious enough to come on and talk about her experience with emetophobia because she was emetophobic for as far back as she could remember, even as a kid, but she's not anymore. And that's why I say this is a feel-good story. So it's a great discussion. Uh, Holly really talks about sort of the mental shift that helped her get around it. Uh, we kind of weave the exposure thing into it. So it's a good conversation. But before we get into the interview, I just need to remind you that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There are three really good books on anxiety and anxiety recovery that I've written that have helped thousands of people. You can find those on my website at theanxioustruth.com. They're right there. Uh, my morning podcast and newsletter, which is called The Anxious Morning, that's free. That's also on, right there on theanxioustruth.com. Uh, and if you are finding the podcast or my work specifically helpful, if you want to find a way to help it remain free of sponsorships and ads, because I am approached every week by people waving money at me, they want to get to you. Uh, ways that you can help keep this, the work uh, sponsorship and ad free can be found at theanxioustruth.com slash support. It is never required, but is always appreciated uh, when you do that. So thank you very much. All right, let's get on to it. Um, Holly and I spoke for about 25 minutes. Uh, afterwards, I will come back and wrap this up. I will give you some resources that hopefully will be useful to you. And I hope this is helpful. I hope that you find some inspiration, some encouragement in this. Let's go. All right, we're back. Hey, House, what up? Good to see you. Hey, yeah, nice to see you too. It's been a minute or so since you're on the podcast. I, I think, think it's, it's like, literally been a couple of years or something. I think so too. The last time I think we did was your uh, the Benzo which were all thing, which was great. Oh, that was cool. a really good episode. Yeah, I'll link that one. If you go to theanxioustruth.com slash 211, I'll link the episode that Holly and I did where you were <laughs> gracious enough to talk about your benzodiazepine experience. But today, we're going to talk about emetophobia because as it turns out, you live that too. You've yes. been busy. I was very busy in my whole anxiety career. But I will say that for me, the emetophobia was probably the biggest thing and it was very much... Uh, the underlying a uh, sort of a, a sort of un it was underneath everything as well you know yeah. it's yeah it, and it was the thing that i can remember having as long as i have a memory do you know what i mean it was like from childhood as well so yeah it was it was always there so there's always some and you know there's really no definitive answers to what causes emetophobia a lot of people will a lot of experts say well yeah it was a you know, uh, a really negative experience with vomiting at some point. Uh, for those of you, you know what, there's going to be an intro, so I'm not going to explain it. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, yeah. But um, can you remember? What, is there Was there a specific thing just out of curiosity? It ultimately didn't matter in the way you got over it. But can you remember a specific incident that kind of triggered it? Well, the, it, it, like from being a small child, I just remember... I, and I think if you can remember certain things from being a very young child, they're probably things that have stuck with you. So I remember being at like a 
a friend's birthday party when we were like six or something and like a girl was like sick at the table and went sort of all over the table and and it was just like you know shocking and and all the, I just I remember like hearing the sort of tone of the adults oh Jenny's been sick and it was just so sort of horrible and and it felt like it was shameful it wasn't obviously it, it, it isn't you know like she's yeah. a little six-year-old kid that had eaten too much cake and stuff but like it's just it happened and I remember just being utterly like sort of freaked out and disgusted and I felt like shame for her you know and just like oh my god that's like the worst thing that could happen sort of thing so I can remember like bits like that and I was always very scared of it you know mm. happening and stuff and then yeah and and I mean do you want me to t <laughs> like I had a my sort of big experience with it was when I was 10 or 11 11 and this is the boat story my parents had a boat yeah my parents bought a sailing yacht and took a sailing on the north sea <laughs> the bit between england and norway um a really rough sea and we were on the boat and there was a one particular trip where it was 14 hours and we'd left on the last tide couldn't get back in and we we had a false weather report we thought it was going to be flat and calm like it was the day before and it was like you know you're looking sort of at the top of the mast for the next wave come in it was horrendously scary and my parents were very new they were novices to it you know and um so they were kind of you know there was a lot of like genuine anxiety for a very good reason on board it was just me my sister and my parents and my mum was so seasick like so seasick and I remember I was clipped on like for safety for my life I was clipped on to the cockpit with my life jacket on and and it was freezing, man. I had like big jumpers and coats and stuff. And my mom was just sitting next to me, like repeatedly throwing up, you know. And I was already kind of, I, I didn't know the word and that's a big, but you know, I was already very sort of frightened of that. And I knew I had 14 hours of this boat trip and there was nothing I could do about it. And I, my mom later admitted to us that she said, she was so seasick that she'd actually wished that the boat would just sink and we would drown because then it would be over. Like, you yeah. know, such a hot, horrific sort of... So she was going through hell, you know. She was... Because seasickness can be kind of awful, you know. I'm sure um, it is, yeah. And terrified at the same time. It's a genuinely yes. dangerous and because you were in a genuinely terrifying situation. So that was my, you know, and that was the sort of trigger. It was almost like a PD PTSD thing for my whole... Yeah. panic disorder and everything sorry it feels like a bit of a therapy session for no me. no no <laughs> yeah. it, it, that makes sense though because a lot of people uh, you know there's that whole like <laughs> we've got to find out what triggered it and that's very very common there was some really negative association with being nauseous or vomiting and yeah a lot of people would probably call that even a traumatic experience yes like you know yeah. the whole family almost dies in a rough sea and your mother is constantly sick so i get it then why wouldn't yeah. you end up a i was surrounded by fear from my parents you know at a very sort sure. of age where you think your parents know what they're doing and you know like realizing like they don't know what they're doing dad has no idea how we're gonna make it for sure yeah, so I mean, you could see where that would make sense. You would glue that that fear of vomiting or vomiting to that terrible situation, which makes perfect sense. So, exactly, yeah. We talk about emetophobia, and you and I have talked about this. Holly's one of yes. the admins in my Facebook group, and, and we've been friends for years now. So, we've talked about the emetophobia thing. Yeah. And I remember at one point, if, and if there's anything you ever want me to edit out of this, just tell me and I'll do that. But, sure. um, you know, we were talking about emetophobia with other people in the group, and, and I, I think you got a, a little angry with me with. Like, no way. It's not exposure. I can't, I would have freaked out if anybody had ever told me to do exposure for that's not the way you do it. And, and I know, yeah. I know you felt a little bit uh, dismissed by me and, and we had a good conversation about it. We worked it out, but it started all of this, which is really good. There was so much good came out of that conversation. Yeah. I just, for me, if, if I had, you know, rocked up in the group with the emetophobia and was told that the only way to get over the emetophobia was to sit and watch videos of people throwing up, you know, even incrementally or gradually, I would have just said, like, well, clearly you have no idea because that's just not possible. Like, I would right. have just run a mile. Like, I, there's no way I would have 
put myself into that situation you know I just but it's fine I'll just carry on avoiding it and you know staying yeah. in for three months in the winter when there's a sickness bug going around that's fine I'll just do that instead you know I think so many people watching and listening right now can can actually a hundred percent relate to what you're saying because I yeah. say this all the time emetophobes are the hardest I don't mean hard I'm not picking on you guys I love you guys but the most difficult nut to crack is the emetophobic who says no j then I'll just live like this the rest of my life that's fine yeah. Um, but as it turns out, as we go through this conversation, you guys will see, like, sit tight, stick with us here, because in the end, it's we wound be. up in the same place, yeah, yeah. Uh, just with some different paths. So doing exposures and watching people vomit and listening to the sounds and the smells and all of those things, which are typical when you treat emetophobia in therapy, was not what you did. What, what was it that started to change this from, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen to a human being, and I must never allow it. And I want to get back to the idea when you said that was sort of the underlying driver, because often it is very important. Yeah. But what was the change? What started to change for you? It was super gradual. And to be honest, it was kind of by accident. So I was working more on my um, panic disorder because that was the most sort of crippling thing that was, you know, a, a, a panic attack, like multiple times a day, every day. You know, it's kind of... <laughs> Well, yeah. thin, you know, after 22 years of it, yeah. So I decided finally, like, God, you know, I hadn't really read that much up on it. I just, I thought that had been, you know, me. So I was doing the work on the, I, I discovered, you know, this whole thing about accepting and surrendering and, oh, and I stopped taking the Valium. So I, you know, changed, started changing my reaction to, to the panic and to the anxiety. And so in doing that, a few things sort of happened. One was that I, be, I, I got really good at recognizing what was anxiety, at sort of being able to see anxiety attach itself to various symptoms or to various sensations or even thoughts, because I would be like, um, well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll get back to that one in a second. So there was that. So by, so by, and by facing the fear of like, you know, a panic attack being right there and, and practicing sort of, you know, like looking at it and, and being okay with it and not trying to just run away from it. It, it, it enabled me to kind of, it sounds really stupid to say, but it enabled me to, to look at anxiety and, and recognize it, you know? And so when I started really thinking about what it, so, so, and then there's another thing is that I'm married to a sailor, right? who goes sailing all the time, deals with people being seasick and, you know, like all my worst fears, you know, being trapped on a boat, being seasick, like is yeah. genuinely my number one fear. Yeah, sure. Um, and look who you married. Crazy. <laughs> you couldn't write this stuff. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and another thing you need to know about what I was like is that I kept it very secretive. I was very secretive about my, it was like, if I talked about it, it was like admitting it. It was like, it, I don't know. I thought it gave it more power by saying, I'm really scared of, you know. So I would, you know, gradually through our relationship, I would hear Matt, that's my husband, talking about someone that got seasick on the boat or, you know, like, or just even like regular stuff like being hung over or whatever, you know, and, and, and people being sick. And, and I would hear, and I would be like totally triggered and sitting there in a sort of, you know, silent panic attack. <laughs> but like my secretiveness of it was almost, was more powerful than my like, please stop mm -hmm. talking about this of it. And so I would kind of have to sit through kind of listening to to conversations about this and when you're with someone for like you know a long time it <laughs> eventually I started to just you know play with saying like I'm actually like a bit not great at this at, you know like how can you deal with being seasick like it's kind of you know it wouldn't sit well with me you know like that yeah. was a big deal for me to even say it like that to even say to matt to your husband yes, just to say yes. it to him yeah sure yeah okay. he knew i had panic attacks and stuff but to even but it felt like to admit that i was scared of you know this thing that he would talk so casually about like it just seemed mm -hmm. i don't know kind of dumb you know like so i was just secretive about it and then i started playing with just like you know starting to admit like that I found it quite difficult. And therefore, you know, I would hear him say, I would hear him say, you know, he 
witnessed people on board that were so seasick, like my mom was, you know, where right. they honestly wished, this is a common thing where some people, it affects them so bad, they kind of wish that they would just drown. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, throw me overboard. It. Yeah. Right. yeah. And in, he says, when he gets seasick, because he's like, everyone gets seasick. And I was like, really? But like, you don't get seasick. He's like, yeah, of course I do. And I was like, what do you do when you're seasick? He's just like, I just carry on as normal. I keep eating, I keep drinking because I need to send my body a message that everything's okay. And I was like, huh? What? <laughs> That's <Yeah>. crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and then he was just like, yeah. So then I'll just be like drink and then be sick maybe. And then after a day or so it's gone away. And I, it was un fathomable to me that he could be like that that this could happen to him the worst thing in the world could happen to him and he would carry on drinking water and carry on eating and just like it yeah. was unbelievable i just couldn't believe it so i thought he naturally i just thought he was crazy right and so but he, as the time goes on and and then when i started working on my my panic panic stuff and when I started, you know, and then also looking at that, like, you have to send your brain a message that you're okay, and you act like you're okay, even when you're having a massive panic attack, because you sort of send, I was like, well, it's kind of similar to what Matt says, because he would say that the people that would suffer really badly were the people that were scared, and it was the fear, it wasn't the seasickness, it was the fear, they would just let, and they would just give up, and they would just kind of lose control of, of they would just sit there, like, getting moved yeah. around by the boat instead of being like, okay, I'm here and I'm okay. They would just, you know, give up. Right, right. right. Um, and, and he said it's, and it was because they were so like scared. It was just like a, it was a mental thing. He says, it's not a physical thing. It's a physical thing that they're being sick. And like, yeah, and it's super unpleasant. We all agree on that. Yeah. But he's like, it's not, you know, and people, and so it would just blow my mind that people would go on boat trips knowing there's a chance they're going to get seasick or, you know, like, and so I started taking all this in and starting just, it was like a light on the horizon burning, just saying like, maybe it's the, it's not as bad as you think it is. And maybe it's not, maybe Matt's not crazy. <laughs> like maybe my fear of it is what's irrational because other people can also, you know, I've got friends and bandmates and they're talking about someone else I drink and they were sick into a pint glass and it was hilarious. And I'd just be like sat there thinking like, this is the most horrendous story I've ever heard. And they're laughing yeah. about it, you know? And I was like, how is this possible? And it just started to dawn on me that maybe it was me and that it was, I was being super rational about it. Mm -hmm. And so from the from the work I was doing with my panic disorder stuff with the with the panic attacks like facing the fear and like I said being able to recognize it I used to allow myself to like think I didn't watch a video I didn't do anything like that but I would think and I'd just be like what is it that is so terrible why is it the worst thing in the world like what is it is it being sick is it seeing someone else like what is it and when I really thought about it it's not it wasn't the being sick thing like not pleasant of course no, but no, it, no, it no. was the I started to recognize that even thinking about it would send me like into this oh my god like grip the side of the boat like grip them, like you're gonna yeah. die you know and I started to recognize and I was like hang on but that's anxiety that's not everyone can't go through that every time they throw up because I mean the world would just fall to bits because right it's just... there are people being sick right now right, right now, now. <laughs> probably 10 million people in the world are being sick right now yeah you know yeah. People are getting drunk every night at the risk of knowing they're maybe going to be sick in the morning or whatever. You know what I mean? Or in the taxi on the way home. Like, yeah, oh, well, sure. you know, worth it. Totally worth it. So it can't it can't be like that for everyone. That feeling of like, oh, my God, and the heart's racing and just like the I always describe it as like a desperation. Like if it makes you feel desperately like you have to avoid this and stop it at all costs, that's like a clue that it's. Yeah. It's anxiety, you know. And, and then, but that came from the other work that you were doing, the panic yes. attack work. Yeah, you should recognized that. it. Yeah. Right. I, I right. know what it feels like. And I know 
what that f- I, I know what adrenaline feels like in my blood you know like it was like and all I had to do was think of it and you and it was and it's going you know yeah. and it just it, it made me realize that it wasn't the mechanics of throwing up or do you know what I mean like yeah, it yeah. was the anxiety and I was already facing the anxiety through the the panic attack stuff I'm like I'm already facing that. I've faced it. I've sat with it. I've, I've let. I've woken up in the middle of the night and let a panic attack just come at me full force. I've already faced like the worst thing that there is. Yeah. So. So I realised that it it wasn't being sick that I was afraid of. It was the fear that had attached itself to it. And that's that may, and it maybe just, it actually. And I think it's important to recognize in this situation, I'm not going to put any words in your mind, you correct me anytime, but if what I hear when you tell that story is you would have been unwilling and, and I get that, like, no way, I'm not watching videos, I'm not listening to the sounds of people, but you, because of the shame around it, you didn't want to say anything about it, you actually listened to stories, you listened to people talk about it, you didn't want to do that exposure, but you yeah. were exposed to it, and over time, yes. that that did start to change like, all right, wait a minute here. I don't like this. Those were terrible experiences that I had with them. I don't want to repeat that again. Of course, I don't want to be sick, but maybe it's not the worst thing that could possibly happen to a human being in recorded history. That starts yeah. to seep in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And in the end, that really is the way emetophobia begins to recede. Like that realization that like, okay, nobody wants this to happen, but I have irrationally turned it into this horrific it must never possibly happen i can't handle this i can't handle it so what what was the the, the other mechanics of it at this point maybe you get sick maybe you don't you get pregnant you have a baby i mean we know kids get sick all the time so you know how old is misty now she's five six years old at this five point. yeah yeah okay so you've been through a bunch it. of times yeah so I, it has- still happen. i'm one of those you get a mess of I, I think one of the only things I ever read about emetophobia is that obviously there's different, some people maybe are sick all the time and still have emetophobia, and I don't know about that. But yeah. in my own personal experience, I think I was last sick when I was 14 years old. Like, yeah, it just doesn't happen to you. I mean, <laughs> mine yeah. tomorrow, but... Yeah, yeah, but I've been in situations where, you know, I had kidney stones and I was, like, retching and, you know, I've been... <laughs> Yeah. And I've had yeah. anxiety that's got so high that I've ended up retching where I'm like, oh, my God, this is it. This is my world falling apart. Because if this is going to happen when yeah. I have a panic attack, my life is over because I've panic attacks. Or I had panic attacks all the time. Right, right, right. So like that would some because there was always that sort of threat in my panic attacks that like maybe you're going to lose it so badly. Like because I would always think that like, maybe I'm just going to like implode or explode or disappear or lose my mind. Even under all of that was like, maybe it's going to make you sick. Like, and then yeah. maybe every time you get a panic attack, that's what's going to happen to you, which would be that's, like just game over, you know. That's so important. Yeah, that is really so important because a lot of people in this community, people who listen to the podcast and whatnot, it does come down to that. But it, but I'm emetophobic, so all of your stuff doesn't count, Drew. Like, it doesn't, I can't do that because I know I won't die. I know I won't go insane. That isn't my fear. My fear is that this will make me vomit. Yeah. And it keeps so many people stuck and they feel like they can never get better. But in the end, so, oh, well, you don't have to work on panic attacks. You have to work on your emetophobia, which yeah. I'm guessing that it all worked together as everything got better at the same time for you, I'm guessing. Or yeah, well, I kind of got better from the, the panic attacks and that stuff not first but like i did and then do you remember when i got pregnant and i had like the mother of all setbacks yes really like there was two things but one of the things was just like my mom had very bad morning sickness and so did my sister and i was just like i'm not i thought i was like hubris like you can't do this is insane like you're definitely not well enough to to do this because if you get super sick like you just you know i don't know know you're going to walk, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I get that. And it's so interesting for people listening to it because, you know, half the population is women. It might get pregnant. And yes, if you're emetophobic and pregnant, oh boy. And oh, I remember I've written when it you off. had. Yeah, but, you know, that secrecy thing and that shame thing that you were talking about. No, we were already friends at that point. And I remember you reaching out and like, I don't know, the wheels fell off. Like I was doing so great and I'm stuck in the house again. You never once mentioned that. Never. 
None. Like, and I get that because there was that, I don't, I can't say that part. I'm having panic attacks again. Oh, but uh-huh. the part you left out in those conversations was I'm terrified that I might experience morning sickness and get sick. Yeah. So, so many people suffer from that. They don't want to say that, but it is the driver. It's the bedrock driver of all of the panic that if I panic, I might get sick. And so I can't yeah. allow panic to happen and therefore I can't, and it's a terrible cycle that keeps going. So what did it look like then in the end? You know, you get pregnant, you go through your pregnancy, Misty is born, like Matt is still out there getting sick and watching people grow up all the time. Like what's, <laughs> what's different now? Like mechanically, like nuts and bolts, what's different in your life now? I don't get triggered by people being sick. Like very occasionally I feel, I'll feel the adrenaline kick in a little bit because I'm like, oh, God, you know. And it's just, a, a, you know, from as long as I can remember, it's been like my go-to switch, you know, that yeah. if someone's sick or, you know, it used to be like if I opened Facebook and someone was complaining that they had a stomach bug, I would just like close Facebook and be like, I can't even look. At, and I would unfollow that person, you know, because I couldn't yeah, bear yeah. to see any more updates about their stomach bug. Like, I just couldn't that do it. Anymore. Oh, God, no, I just don't care at all, no. I mean, I don't even, I don't get triggered. It took a long time for that. I would still get that first fear. Like, Mm -hmm. I think even in uh, a Claire Weeks episode that we did where that came up, like something about emetophobia came up and it first fear triggered me. And I was like, you know, uh, I could feel it like, you know, rushing through my veins and I and although I was like I'm not scared of this this is okay you know I was still in that stage with it and now it just doesn't even kind of enter my yeah. thoughts you know like it just if my daughter's sick I just take care of her I let her cuddle up to me I'm not scared if I catch it like I'm just you know like just yeah, yeah doing just looking after I'm just worried you know want her to feel nice you know and in the end because it, it is a terribly unpleasant experience but not no longer the end of the world in your you have yeah. prob- probably and more it's not even more that healthy. terrible uh, experience really it's not pleasant but like i've watched my daughter you know be sick and she's just like the done comes yeah. back in the room switches on the telly like, yeah. I know. it's not a problem i'll oh, just bring me the bowl just in case you know like it's actually it isn't it just isn't anywhere near that thing that i held it on this like you know, horrific pedestal to me. Like, it's probably just the most not... important part of this conversation. I think right yeah. there, what you just said. It's not that thing because, again, the the emetophobic community is very adamant. It's like, nope, nope, you don't understand. It is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Yeah. And I'm your experience fine. and the way you process that tremendous work. Like, I have <laughs> tremendous admiration for the fact that you did that without really like you didn't have a therapist. You didn't have any of that stuff. It's very helpful, but. In the end, that mechanism still worked the same way, yeah. like changing your relationship. Like, oh, wait, I guess this is probably rational. And guess what? I, if Matt can handle it and all those people can handle it, I can probably handle this too. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was the, the realization that maybe it's not everyone else just being like so weirdly blasé about it, but that it was me that was being super rational. So instead of trying to make them understand how awful it was for me, because I was never going to do that, right? Because I was secret. It right. was secret. Sure, sure. So instead of trying to be like, no, you don't understand, this is the worst thing, I'd just be like, okay. And then eventually it was like, let me try and come to where they, actually, I'd rather be where they are. Can I think about it like they think about it? That would be great, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and so it was that. It was realizing that it was me that was had this out of proportion and recognizing what anxiety feels like. So it was honestly like a purely cognitive sort of exercise of just like, if I really think about it, what is it about it that is so terrible? Like, what is it? You know, because it could be like, or it could be, it, it might be like, it's the shame of it, which it was a big part of it as well, you know. Sure. But when you think about like, but if you could throw up in secret, is that okay? And it's like, well, no, of course not. It's still not okay. So like, okay, so what is it? You know, like, so I would just take myself through these sort of like mind exercises, not even purposefully, but just kind of like, yeah is that you know yeah yeah, and i and i sort of came to this conclusion of just like it's because of and and as soon as i would think about what it you know think about that situation i would feel the adrenaline i would feel that desperation i would feel the sort of like heart racing and i'd be like wait a minute that's anxiety that's not being sick that's anxiety 
Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Tremendous work. Tremendous in the end. <laughs> you know, it's funny when you said it's almost purely cognitive. In emetophobia, it kind of is. Because even if you do go down the route of watching videos and listening to sounds and there are smells and there are even jelly beans and all kinds of therapeutic tools. Yeah, that it sounds, sounds horrible. Horrendous. Don't get me wrong. I, I would agree. It sounds very unpleasant. But, you know, even when you do that, emetophobia is difficult because ethically you can't, and you can't make somebody vomit to expose. People will always say, I can't recover because I can't expose myself to that, that like you can a panic attack, which is sure. true. But Holly is a great illustration of how that mechanism works even without the direct experience of, oh, I got sick. Now, some yeah. emetophobes actually do overcome it because they do get sick. Yes, like, I've heard people they don't say have, that. They don't have a choice. Like I got, you know, I got pregnant and I was sick every morning for three weeks and I wasn't emetophobic anymore because they actually yeah, yeah. and discovered Which it was Which also okay. would sound terrifying, you know, because you think, so right. the only way I can get over this is to be sick so many times that I don't care anymore. Like, I mean, that's just, that would seem, no, that's it, run a mile stuff as well. It's horrible, you know? right? Exactly. And, and it must be a terribly <clears throat> unpleasant experience. I can always acknowledge that, but it's amazing how it, that works. Like yeah. I've but turned I have, this into a, you know. Yeah, I have like seriously, fully not being secretive. I do not have a metaphobia anymore. And I had it hardcore for a very yeah. long time. And I don't anymore. And I haven't thrown up and I haven't like, I haven't, you know, I've been in situations where other people are sick, but I was all, I was, that was happening to me before as well. You know, like it's not like yeah. I've never seen someone throw up before. So it just, it all changed because of, I mean, mostly because of the, the panic work that I did about learning to let the anxiety come and, and let it sort of, you know, and not fight it. That was such a major part because it let me look at it. And it, you know, it's like the Wizard of Oz thing, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it seems like this big scary thing and you pull the curtain, it's just this little old man, you know, pulling some levers, you know, it, it really was that. So it was just like, oh, wait a minute, that's that anxiety thing again, isn't it? You know? And, yeah. I mean, it worked for, for lots of things, you know, like, but the emetophobia was the massive thing. But I just started being able to apply it to so many things in my life. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, I so appreciate you sharing this, and I'm sure people watching will appreciate it as well. And I'm sure many of you will think, well, that's great. That worked for her, but it can't possibly work for me. I, this is, uh, you know, and we always have to acknowledge, like, you have the right to choose the life you want. Yeah, like you, sure. don't, you don't have to do exposure. You don't have to get better. You can choose to just try not to be sick for the rest of like that. So that would be okay. Like, you know, yeah. but it is possible. People do recover from emetophobia. So it can be definitely. Different. And I just want to say it wasn't like a, a click, like an instant, like me telling you, you hearing this information now, it's not like you're going to be like, Oh yeah. Okay. And now you're fine. <laughs> like it yeah. really was it's like, it, even like in, it, just be like, just let it be something that like, just tweaks something in the back of your mind and niggles at you a little bit. Like, remember that thing what Holly said about, you know, maybe it was, maybe it's not as bad as you think it is. Maybe if you can learn to recognize the anxiety attaching itself to that symptom, because it could have attached itself to your heart or to your breathing or, you know, to anything, whatever. Like it, 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 it isn't the being sick. It's, it's the the anxiety that has attached to that the reaction to it and i think i'll only add one more thing before we wrap up i think which is well maybe it's maybe it's not the worst thing in the world is a tremendous realization to start to let in like i'm going to let reality weigh in here a little bit and re recognize my irrationality which is great but even if it is the worst thing in the world the most important conclusion is but even if it is as bad as i think it is i can handle that yeah, like I can handle that. That's so important because at the root of almost all of these things is, and I, I won't be able to handle it. Nobody can ever really fully define what can't handle is, but yeah, you handle everything. You handle everything in your life, even when it feels shitty. To handle yeah, it. like yeah. I was, I was just saying it then, like oh, and then I was scared that I would be sick every time I had a panic attack, and and then right. and then I couldn't finish it because I didn't know what the end of that was. Right. But like, and, and then, then I would, yeah, and then. And then, I don't know, <laughs> right, right, which is such a powerful tool. So yeah, I appreciate you, Alice. I thank you for talking about this openly. I know that it was a sore spot for you for a long time, and I appreciate where you are now with it, so. Thanks, yeah. It, yeah, good. it was a big sore spot. Alice, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We'll do it again sometime. One day we'll finish our Claire Week series, one day. <laughs> yeah, we should do that, yeah. But Misty will be graduating from college. We're like, hey, let's get back to that. <laughs> <So, laughs> that would be cool.
<laughs> so for those of you who are in the Facebook group, Holly is there in the Facebook group. If you want to ask questions, I'm sure you'd be, you know, yeah. she'll jump in and answer them, which is totally fine. Uh, if you're, I don't know, if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever, you want to ask questions, I can always try to pass them on, whatever it is. But I'll be back in a couple of minutes. I'll wrap it up. I'm going to give you some notes, show notes and stuff. And that's it. Thanks, Holly. Cool. Thank you. See you next time. Okay, we are back in the studio, but this time it really was a change. How about that? That never happens. Anyway, thank you so much for Holly, to Holly for coming on and sharing her story, um, especially knowing how secretive she was about it and sort of felt a little shameful about it. I think there was, it was a big deal, and I really appreciate that she came on to try to offer a little bit of hope to somebody who might be listening. And if you are listening and you are dealing with a metaphobia, hopefully Holly's story gave you a little bit of hope and a little bit of encouragement that you can actually get better. So that's the takeaway today. I know it sounds like the worst thing in the world, but I promise it is not. So I am going to link on the show notes for this episode, which you'll find at theanxioustruth.com slash 211, 211. So it's theanxioustruth.com slash 211. If you're watching on YouTube, it's right below you on the screen there. Go there and I will have a couple of useful uh, emetophobia references. All the show notes are here. Uh, and hopefully there'll be things that you might find helpful on top of just the podcast episode. So that is it. We are wrapping up. Uh, episode 211 of The Anxious Truth, and you know it's over because music, as always, uh, Afterglow by Ben Drake is the music that you hear at the beginning and the end of every one of these podcast episodes. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com if you are so inclined. You go check him out. Tell him I said hello. He's a good dude. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with uh, asking a favor. If you're listening to the podcast on Apple or on Spotify or someplace where you can subscribe, follow, rate, review, Subscribe, follow the podcast, leave a five-star rating, and write a paragraph or two short review to tell people that you like the podcast because it helps other people find it. I appreciate all those of you who have done that. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. It really helps. And I will be back again next week with another episode. I still don't know what it's going to be, but I will be here. I promise you that. So uh, I will remind you, as I always do, to keep moving forward. And why? Because this is the way. Yeah, y'all doing fine. It's all around you, you can breathe it in. This is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're gonna win.